So Ezekiel chapter 36 tonight, in verses 1 through 15, we see quite a bit in regards to the promise of God restoring and renewing the land. This is, this is what we see here in the first 15 verses of chapter 36. So as stated before, it's, it's broken up in two sections of prophecy. The first has to do with the land. In Leviticus chapter 25, the Lord speaks these words to the people of Israel. And I think this is a great reminder that kind of brings this thing into a better understanding. Notice what he says in verse 23 of Leviticus 25. He says, the land shall not be sold permanently for the land is mine. You are strangers and sojourners with me. Notice here in Leviticus 25 and verse 23, the Bible says to the people of Israel, God reminded them that the land is and belongs to the Lord their God. So the land is mine. And even though the people of Babylon destroyed the city of Jerusalem and made ruin of it, destroyed its temple in 586 B.C., and then ultimately, when the temple was rebuilt at about 516 B.C., it was then destroyed in 70 A.D. by the Romans. So we see the temple destroyed. Now, the point I want to make with this is that in this passage of Scripture here, Ezekiel is ministering to the people of Israel that are coming from the uh, Babylonian you know, the city being besieged. And remember, back in chapter 24, the Lord had spoke specifically to Ezekiel and said, you now have a message to share with the people. You have now something to say to them. And remember that it was in that chapter, the tragedy of Ezekiel's wife, her death, and Ezekiel not able to mourn or to, to do a proper grieving for his wife. He says, you know, go and... Show your face before the people and no, no mourning, no weeping for your wife. Just, just stay the course. And then he says, and then with that, you will open your mouth and speak to the people because like your wife was the object of your affection, so is the temple to the people of Judah. But the temple is going to be destroyed and leveled. And they're going to be taken captive and they're going to come into the land. They're going to be rejected. They're going to be captive. They're going to be dejected. All of these things. And ultimately, he says, then you can minister to them from the same place of hurt. The object of their affection, the temple, was destroyed as well. So the message now becomes more of <clears throat> a heartfelt, real message, personal. But Ezekiel ministers to the people now. In chapter 36, the Lord's reminding them that even though Babylon besieged the city of Jerusalem, from the outside, it would seem to the known world that they were done. Now, we went into quite a bit of, <clears throat> you know, eschatology kind of at the closing out of the message because really the end of chapter 36 is a fearful and frightful verse for the nations today that surround Israel. The land is, is God's. We've just seen that. And, and all throughout Scripture, you know, God's the one that led the people into the land of Canaan. He gave the land to, to Abraham and them. And uh, we see here that through Abraham's descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. It's, it's kind of a good thing that we are studying through Genesis and the life of Abraham on Sunday morning. So... We're very familiar with this covenant promise that God had made. And we see it in chapters 12 and 15 of Genesis. But the Lord said this. He says to Abraham in regards to his descendants and to the land. He says, get out from your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then the Lord reiterates the same 
to Abraham. And he makes known to Abraham that he will establish this covenant with him. Now remember, the covenant that God had made in chapter 15 was to reaffirm what he had already told Abraham. But, but here's what I think is interesting. At the close of chapter 36, it says, Thus says the Lord, I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. I will increase their men like a flock, like a flock offered as holy sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem on its feast days. So shall the ruined cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So at the close of the chapter, we see this promise being made that though the land lay desolate and the temple destroyed, God says, this land will be inhabited again, not just, just by any people, but by God's people, that God will regather, that he will bring his people back into the land. That's one of the promises that we see in what is known as the captivity. They would be captive for 70 years, the 70-year captivity. And remember, this is one of the messages, if you will, that we see in the book of Daniel. Remember uh, Daniel's uh, famous you know, note, if you will, of his understanding of what was taking place. You know, Daniel was a man who, who ministered in the days of King Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel was a man who was very acquainted with prophecy. And, and he shared a word in regards to it. And you could see it in Daniel chapter 9 and 10. And, and one of the things that Daniel said in regards to the message that he was given to speak to the people and, and share the word of God was the very fact that Daniel knew that the, the end time, if you will, of their captivity was coming to a close. So in chapter 9, he prays for the people. But then we also see that Daniel realized that the time of their judgment was coming to an end. And he's seeing here how the time of their weeks would be ended. You know, Daniel talks about reading from the word, most likely... Um, understanding and receiving the interpretation of, of Jeremiah. Where, where Jeremiah in chapter 29 and, and also, uh, you know, and 25, chapters 25 and 29 of Jeremiah, Jeremiah speaks of a time frame, a 70 year period. So the beginning of that is, is here, it's, it's now, it's, they're in the early stages of this. Their captivity began in 605 B.C. And their captivity would end at about 535, 536 B.C. That's 70 years. Captivity. And then 15 years later, they would rebuild the temple that was destroyed in 586 B.C. They would rebuild that in 516 B.C. And then ultimately the temple would be destroyed. The emphasis that I'm making is really important because when you get to a promise made in the New Testament, you'll see that all of this plays a significant role in the history of Israel and all that God would do among the people of Israel and ultimately for them as he restores it. So now back to the first section of this. So in verse two, it seems that the enemies of God said that the ancient heights have become our possession, meaning the people of Edom assume that because God had besieged the city with Babylon. The people of Edom thought, well, now the land is ours. We just read God in his word says the land is his. And then the Lord reminds them that he's going to prosper the land once again, that it will flourish. And why? Because God had ultimately told Abraham in chapter 12 and chapter 15, and even in chapter 15, he begins to give him kind of like the dimensions of the land. Now, Last week, I kind of gave you these dimensions and these pictures without really, uh, you know, any type of view for yourself. And uh, our IT team in the back was ready to put these up because they were prepared, not because I told them I was going to be teaching on that, but they kind of already knew where I was going. This is what I love about a church that is well-taught and well-versed in the Bible. 
I want to help you guys a little bit kind of understand why this should be important to you. Now, we talked about an event that would be happening this last Monday. Uh, has to do with what is called the Abrahamic Accords. And you might not have an understanding of what the Abrahamic Accords are, but basically what it is, it's a peace agreement, a treaty of peace, really of diplomatic relations in the Middle East. And, and if you remember that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. And this accord, if you will, this peace agreement, um, really is for the purpose of the normalization between the United Arab Emirates and the state of Israel. The Saudis, remember I talked about two groups of Muslims, the Shiite and the Sunni, and this is important for you to understand. Why? Because, you know, the larger part will play a role in the end time. So this Abrahamic Accord that really has the United States involvement. It really has um, the support of the United States, especially uh, because of our ties with Saudi Arabia and all of this. There is only a few nations that gathered together that signed. Four, four countries, Bahrain, Israel, Morocco, Sudan, and the United um, Arab Emirates. And so you might say, well, what does that have to do with kind of what we're looking at here today? Well, just last week, the push was at the UN, uh, the people of Saudi Arabia, the, the crown prince, was pushing for this peace in the Middle East. Now, the fact that, you know, there is a push for this, remember that this has to do with Really, the policy has to do with aid from the United States. Anybody that's in the military will understand that this more is a military move than anything. It's for the purpose of us as a country providing um, support militarily. It has to do with really strengthening the military might. So the United States has always been a support of one country in the Middle East and supports tremendously a good portion of their military in that regard, whether it be through, um, you know, training and weaponry and everything that has to do with that. So with that, we know that Israel is the number one country in the Middle East that we support in that area. So this Abrahamic Accord is trying to strengthen ties with the United States and really the push for the Palestinian and the Israelis to come together in an agreement. Now, the strong hand behind this agreement would be the uh, people of Saudi Arabia or Saudi Arabia itself. And so remember that they are longstanding. It is a very rich, um, you know, uh, uh, Islamic uh, uh, a country. And we know that there is much wealth there in the Middle East due to oil and so on and so forth. See, many people think that this has to do with the riches and the wealth and the oil. It has to do more than anything with land. This is what this is all about. And anybody that understands Bible prophecy and even those that understand the military and have gone to the Middle East uh, due to the wars that we've been in over there, it was more than just what the media is telling us that it is. If we know the word, we know that it's to some degree spiritual and also biblical. Now, Something I think that we can look at and consider here is the actual boundaries that was given to Abraham by God and, and what Israel actually possesses today. So if we can, if we can put this picture up on the screen here, this is the, a map, if you will, of the boundaries of the land and then ultimately you'll see there that whole area, that green little line there. This is, this is what was promised. So notice Israel where the red dot is. And if you notice there how small Israel is, you have e Egypt coming up to the side of it there, Sinai, right? You have Lebanon above it, Jordan right next to it, Syria right above it there. And <clears throat> ultimately it's, it's bordered by Jordan Egypt, Lebanon, and Syria, right? 
You see that little sliver of Israel there? But the land that God had given Abraham is actually all of that there. Now, if, if they were to stake their claim today, boy, this would be World War III, wouldn't it be? It, it would be World War Now, back to the text. Now, the reason why I say we do this is because we see here very clearly in what we are looking at what God is promising them, the land. This is the land that belongs to the people of Israel. The land that belongs to them is what God had promised them in the promise that he had made to Abraham. So today, you ask the question, well, how much land has the people of Israel ever really possessed? Well, they've only possessed 33% of those boundaries that you see. They've never fully possessed the entirety of it. And I think it's important um, to really understand that this is exactly what is taking place in Israel. The very fact that we see here that there are, you know, this whole thing of why is there so much emphasis in the Middle East? Well, you know, kind of looking at the text in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, you'll see there that God had promised Israel a great portion of land. And what do we have now? We have now Egypt having to give up some land. We see Turkey and we see also um, Lebanon and Jordan. And we see Saudi Arabia, we see Iraq. And, and in all those instances, we see here that today, you know, this is why it seems easier for, let's say, a country like Iran to say, Israel just needs to be wiped out. Not because the people of Iran in some way know the Bible. I mean, really think about it. Just get that picture back up there. Just look at this. I, I think this is interesting. It's not because, you know, in any sense that, you know, Iran would say, hey, well, you know what? We got all this land here. No, look how much larger Israel would be in the Middle East if they possessed all the land that God had promised them. Now, I tell you today, if that was the case, if, if present day Israel was this size here, Trust me, there would be no nations around them trying to do anything. But we do know this, that the majority of the nations around them, the Arabs and, and Muslims, have a disdain for Israel. And ultimately, this would mean a wider democracy in the Middle East. And even more so, you would see that it's interesting Look how massive these other countries are, even in biblical times, but even today, and how small Israel is. And, you know, its defense system, all those nations around them with all that they have do not have the defense system that Israel has. There's no other country except recently under the Trump administration, the United States uh, purchased an iron dome just like Israel has had functioning for a number of years. And it's interesting because the Iron Dome is its defense mechanism when rockets come flying in from some of these other hostile nations around them. And even within the Western Bank of Israel. And, and, and we've seen many videos of these rockets flying in. And you know what? Out of 200 rockets that will fly in, maybe one or two will hit the ground. All the rest are blown away in the sky by the Iron Dome. It literally finds them, targets them, and blows them up in the sky. Now, when we look at this and we say, man, that is pretty powerful. Yes, it is, because they're the only country in the Middle East that has this. And it shows something. Well, I think that it shows this. It shows God's favor upon them. How is it that this small, according to Iran, insignificant country Israel in the Middle East has such great weaponry and defense. How is it? Well, it's very simple. God made a promise that he's going to keep. Now, looking back at the text here tonight, when they said things like in verse 2, the ancient heights have become our possession, God's the only one that possesses the land. When it says ancient heights, it's talking about the ancient city of Jerusalem. It's talking about 
the everlasting city, Zion, Jerusalem. But Leviticus 25, 23 says it belongs to the Lord. The land is his. So today when we see these atrocities and these things made against the people of Israel, and now with this Abrahamic accord, this, this strengthening of this defense militarily, but also its support, now you can kind of get an idea and a picture as to why our country, the United States of America, is, is really viewed in negative light in the Middle East. Because according to the Arabs and those that have a hate for Israel, we're supporting the wrong team. But I believe that God has used this country. We're not supporting Israel because of our wisdom. We're supporting this country by God's doing. God's the one that has prepared this country for this time that it is. And, you know, people have to question even after we talk about Bible prophecy, the number one question that's always asked is this very thing. Um, you know, where is the United States in Bible prophecy? Well, it's nowhere in Bible prophecy. And the reason being is because of a couple of things. And I, I would say, first and foremost, because... We're not end time players in Bible prophecy. The focus is the Middle East. But if you really think about it, I believe also that we will no longer be a world power like we once were. And I think today, really more because of the decline of our, you know, morality, we're choosing immorality, we are doing things that are leading us further and further away from the things of the Lord. And I, I want you to understand that God uses a nation for a purpose. And the United States, I believe, was raised up by God to be used for a purpose in Israel's history for such a time as this, the times that we're living in now. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1, it says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and like the rivers of the water, he turns it wherever he wishes. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and like the rivers of the water, he turns it wherever he wishes. So think of our country that way. The heart of this country, the heart of this people, our, our military, our leadership, our ability to be a world power is in the hands of the Lord. And he directs it wherever he wishes. We like to think that we are in charge. We like to think that we are the ones, right? But ultimately, Scripture tells us that we are where we are by God's doing. And we have been used for what we are doing now by God's design. I mean, that's just my belief. I, I see that all throughout Scripture, just like God used Babylon and God used Assyria. God uses other countries. God used, um, you know... Um, a King Cyrus, right? And the Medo-Persian Empire to, to deal with the Babylonian Empire. And he used the Grecian Empire. And, you know, and he used the Roman Empire to, to deal with the Grecian Empire. And, and all of these things, God used the nations and the kings. And so like he's done throughout his history, he uses us. And so... The world in and of itself, guys, will come to an end. Peter talks about a day in which the earth will be destroyed. And this ultimately is the end. It's, it's, it's the consummation of all things, which will eventually lead us into a new heaven and a new earth. It's the same thing that God is doing in our lives, right? We talked about this not too long ago in one of our other studies about how because there is a new heaven and a new earth, God makes us as new creations. It's just a preview of what God will ultimately do with us and ultimately what he'll do with his creation. But notice something here. So God refuses, we'll see here in the second section here, to leave his people in the same condition. Just like God says, the land is mine. And so this goes along with the promise. So if the land is the Lord's and he made a promise, and Israel in its entire history, even today, has only, I guess you can say, attained 
What about the other 67%? When will that ever take place? Well, will it ever take place? The answer is yes, it will. At least this is what I see here in Ezekiel chapter 36. So now we move on a little bit here. He goes on to say here, let's move down to verse 8. We already studied this, you know, last week, but I just want to use this getting into the rest of the chapter. He says, but you mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are, are about to come. For indeed, I am for you and I will turn to you and you shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply men upon you and all the house of Israel, all of it. And the city shall be inhabited and the ruins, listen to this, rebuilt. The ruins rebuilt. Now, we know for sure the land is the Lord's and we know that God made a promise. You've seen the boundaries. You got the vision in your mind. And the boundary lines that you've seen there, if you want to follow it up, where's that in the Bible? It's found in Genesis chapter 15. Follow the boundary lines that God spoke to Abraham concerning that. And you'll see there, that's a clear picture of it. The second thing we want to look at here is now the Lord moves from the land to the people. And he says, moreover, verse 16, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me, their way was like the uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity. In other words, he's saying that their works were vile and they were unclean and they were really ultimately what God said he hates in Proverbs chapter 6. The people of Israel were idolatrous. They were worshiping false gods. They were, they were disregarding the word of the Lord. There was much bloodshed of innocent in the land. And basically the people of Israel were living like the nations around them that did not know God. But remember what the Lord says. They thought they were a righteous people by their deeds. Remember, the same references made to the people of Judah in Isaiah's day. Isaiah 64 in verse 6 says, he says, but we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousness like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. In Isaiah 64, we see here a clear picture of what Ezekiel is speaking about in verse 17. He's saying here the, the uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity is the same thing that Isaiah is saying is the righteous acts or deeds of a people who claim to be doing good when they are not. So therefore, I poured out my fury on them for the blood that they had shed on the land and for their idols, which they had defiled it with. Now, notice here, God is dealing with the people and he's reminding them that ultimately his aim is not just to change their behavior, but also to change their heart. Their behavior was vile. He says here, they... They literally made a mockery of God and they defiled the land. Now in chapter 11 of Ezekiel, notice what it says here in regards to God's desire for his people. It's not just a change of behavior, but God says, really, it's a change of heart that I desire. Here is the aim of God. Verse 19 of chapter 11 it says, then I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Now, notice something that he says here. Don't, don't miss this. He says that they may. In other words, God does this in verse 19, giving them a new heart, if you will. Verse 20 says that they may walk in my statutes. God's purpose and aim for his people is that they walk in his statutes, that they walk according to the word of God, that they walk according to his ways, his purpose, his plan. All of this is done to draw God's people to him. And ultimately, this is what this is leading to. It's not 
the end of Israel. Some truly believe, like the people of Edom, when they said, hey, the ancient heights have become our possession. Well, now that Judah's judged and pretty much the city's destroyed and the temple's destroyed, let's go and let's take the land. Others have mistakenly assumed, because God dealt with Israel in such a way that they mistakenly assumed that God was done with Israel, that there was, it's it, it's over. But it's not. Notice what the Lord continues to go on and say. It sounds like what God is doing is saying here, all of this was for a purpose. This was to draw you to me, but it's all by God's doing. So their sin, we see here, displaced them in judgment. God says, your sin has done this. The blood that you shed, the idols, verse 19. So I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord. Wow. And yet they have gone out of his land. Now, others would look at this and they would say, well, there it is there. God has driven them out. But God said there was a purpose. There was an aim behind this. But I have concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. So what we see here, the Lord says, this was done for a purpose. The promise in verse 22 is a very amazing promise. It's Israel's future cleansing. Look at, therefore, to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went the Lord their God. You know, we always say this reference, especially when it comes to us as Christians, uh, this phrase or this reference in regards to Spurgeon saying that God loves his children so much that he doesn't allow them to sin successfully. This is what God is doing here. He refuses to leave the people of Israel the same. Yes, they've been removed out of their land. Their temple has been destroyed. But what do we see here? God is saying, I'm going to multiply the land once again. It's going to be very fruitful. It's going to be in abundance. It will be re-inhabited once again. He says, by the multitudes, verse 10 of chapter 36 says, the ruins will be rebuilt. Listen, nobody wants to know that. And we talked quite extensively about the third temple, right? Because the Bible talks about the abomination of desolation in the Bible. And this whole thing of the abomination of desolation is something that you have to really take to heart because it has to do with really the work that God is going to do among the people of Israel. Now, a couple of passages just to consider. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. Jesus spoke of the coming of the abomination of desolation in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24. And the reason why I'm referencing this here is because Jesus is referencing a future event that is referred to by Daniel. And Jesus says these words, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Notice. It says here, standing in the holy place. Well, there's only one holy place. It's known as the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies is in the temple. Okay, so now we know the first temple that Solomon built, destroyed in 586 B.C. by the Babylonians, rebuilt after the captivity, after the people of Israel came back into the land. God brought them back into the land. But remember, too, some would say, well, there's the regathering. God already brought them back into the land. But read your Bible. A small group came under the leadership of Zerubbabel. That's where we get that whole passage of Zechariah 4, 6. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, thus saith the Lord. And the encouragement to Zerubbabel was to get back to rebuilding the temple. And then after Zerubbabel, there was a group that came with Ezra. And they began to finish the building of the temple. And there was another group that came out of Babylonian captivity with Ezra. This was already some time later. And then there was a third group, a wave that came. And they came with 
um, none other than Nehemiah. Remember, Nehemiah rebuilds the walls. Well, that was the third group. And remember that Daniel never left the boundaries of Babylon. He remained in Babylon because there were still many Jews that stayed there. So some say, well, this is the regathering. Well, no, this is the return. This was their coming back into the land marked the end of the captivity. Just to further solidify what Jeremiah prophesied about, that it was only going to be for a period. Remember, where do we get these 70 years from? Well, the 70 years were the direct result of the people of Israel not honoring what is known as the Sabbath year. We know what the Sabbath is, right? The Sabbath day. No one works on that day. We rest, right? And... But in the Bible, it, always spe- it also speaks of the Sabbath year, the sabbatical year, where they work six years, and then in the seventh year, they rest, and they believe God for provision for that entire year. So I always love the debate against the Seventh-day Adventists that tell me I worship an idol by going to church on Sunday. They say, you worship the sun god. And why do you go to church on Sunday? Well, because Sunday is the first day of the week in which Christ our Savior was raised from the dead. The Sabbath is still Saturday. We've not changed it. Shabbat is Saturday, period. But the Sabbath don't pertain to me. I'm not a Jew. (laughs) That was given to Israel. And the people of Israel live according to that. They live according to the law. They live according to the command. I'm not a Jew. I'm a Chicano, man. I'm Mexican. You know what I mean? It's like... (laughs) I'm a Gentile, man, who's been engrafted into the body of Christ by the blood of Jesus. Now, does the law pertain to me? Of course it does. In the person and work of Christ. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17, I come not to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. Jesus is the only human in the history of humanity that lived a perfect life. And he obeyed the law and he fulfilled it and he kept it. And then he even gave his life as a ransom, as if he broke the law, but he never did. Why would he do that? Because you are breakers of the law. And so because none of us could ever keep the law, Jesus died. He kept it. So now when we come to faith in Christ and, you know, those religious people, you know, they try to put that stain. Well, you know, you're not keeping the commandments. I don't have to. Jesus did. And now Christ in me, according to Colossians 1, is the hope of glory. You might say, well, do you at least follow them? It is in our nature to do so if we're walking in the spirit. What did he say? God's ultimate aim for the people of Israel. Let's just consider them for a moment. In chapter 11, I just read to you two verses that said, what was his purpose? To give them a new heart so that they would what? Walk according to his ways. God gave us his son, Jesus Christ, so that we can walk according to his ways. We have the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise unto the day of our redemption. It's by God's doing, not ours. If I follow the commandments, then where does my salvation come from? Works. Salvation is not about works. You can't save yourself. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus and that alone. The Bible says not anything in and of ourselves, lest anyone can boast and say, well, I'm born again because I go to Living Way and I went to church on Sunday night. (laughs) Now, listen. When Jesus warns about this, it's going to be a time of great deception. Now, we're going to get into some things here that, you know, a lot of people will Get up and they'll say things like, well, you know, what is the view? What is the eschatology of living way? Well, we're Calvary Chapel. It's the core doctrines that we hold to, especially in eschatology. And we are pre-trib in our view. We are premillennial in our view. And that's where our eschatology lies. I, I'm not opposed to anybody else that has any other view. But I believe this is what the Bible teaches us to We have room there to walk comfortably in the very fact that this is how God will lead his people. And and I think of looking to the Old Testament. A lot of guys say, you know, well, church history, you know, the church fathers. Listen, they were just church fathers. They didn't walk with Jesus like the disciples did. They weren't called a friend of God like Abraham was. Well, what did Abraham believe? What did the apostles believe? Well, I'll tell you what, when the disciples, the apostles wrote, The New Testament, they wrote as if Jesus' return was imminent. 
And Jesus reminded them of being with him. Jesus warned the people in this Olivet Discourse in chapter 24 of Matthew's Gospel. And here, once again, we're looking at what is known as the abomination. It's really something that causes disgust and hatred. That's what the word actually means. And desolation is a state of complete emptiness and destruction. So what is the abomination of desolation? Well, this can only be committed by a figure known as the Antichrist. A person who has a following and garners a following with the hopes of people following him, with the hopes of thinking this is the Messiah. This is the one that's going to lead us. Now, I'll tell you guys this. There are many that hold the view that, you know, um, the Antichrist is going to come from Europe. There are some that hold the view that the Antichrist will probably be of Jewish descent. That's why the deception is even greater. You know, the Bible doesn't make this an essential at all whatsoever. Because the Bible doesn't tell us who the Antichrist is going to be, nor does it cause us to look for the Antichrist. It just says that this one who, who will come will, will be the one who will commit this act of this abomination of desolation. Now, as it pertains to the church, well, where's the church? Well, the church age, I believe, according to Scripture will not be in this time of what is known as the tribulation period or will experience the abomination of desolation. Now, in all this here, God says that he's going to, you know, restore the land. He's going to restore his people. And there's this big misconception, too, about God's people, you know, and who they are. Some will say, well, the church is spiritual Israel. I'm here to tell you that that's not biblically sound. We're not spiritual Israel. We don't become Jews because we become born again. God's not done with Israel. And, and you might say, well, we've accepted Jesus as Messiah and they don't even receive him as Messiah. And that is true. You go to Israel today, we've been there many times and, and they rejected Jesus as Messiah. We talked about this last week. You know, you, you see them there and they're praying. You know, they got their prayer shawls. They have their phylacteries tied around their forehead, around their arms, and they're rocking motion back and forth. You know, they're at the Western Wall and they're praying. And it's funny how Christians today want to go back to that. Like if they start praying with a prayer shawl in the church and there they are. Like, what are you doing that for? <laughs> Somehow we've been deceived in thinking that the more Jewish we become, the more spiritual we become. The Jews were lost. They're lost today. They reject Jesus as Messiah. You know, and some say, oh, you got to be good to Jewish people, you know, because those are God's people. But listen, they still got to come to faith in Christ. And if they reject him, they're going to be Jews even in hell. It's not nationality that saves you. It's Jesus that does. So what about Israel? Well, here's going back to the promise that God had made to Abraham, his descendants. Who are Abraham's descendants? The Hebrew people. That's what came forth. And he says, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Well, Abraham and Sarah had Isaac. And Isaac and his wife had Jacob and Esau. Jacob had the 12 tribes of Israel. Out of the tribe of Judah comes the Messiah. Well, there's the promise fulfilled. Through your descendants, Abraham, through your seed, through your lineage, through your family, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All the nations of the earth have been blessed by the person and work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. So if God kept that promise, what about the land? What about what God's going to do with that? Well, ultimately, Israel will one day inherit the entirety of the land. So I want us just for a moment to consider just a couple of things. In Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, it says, He will make a firm covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and offering, and the abomination of desolation will be on a wing of the temple until the decree, destruction is poured out on the desolator. Until there is the abomination of desolation, where that ultimately this will take place. Now, guys, listen, we... I was trying to explain to you guys just an interesting thing about, 
you know, the Temple Mount. There's a couple of pictures we have. One is a very wide view, and I want that picture to go up first, a very wide view. It's, we're standing on the Temple Mount, and we're looking at the city of Jerusalem. That's, that's not the picture. There's another one. There you go. That's a wide view. It's a wide shot of that whole area. So where we're standing right here is on the Mount of Olives. So if we were there right now and we were over there and you were looking at the Temple Mount, you're standing on the Mount of Olives. Now, when you look at this picture here, you'll notice that there's a wall that goes around the city. You see that wall all the way around it there? In between that wall and this area known as the Mount of Olives, this is a Jewish cemetery. In front of that wall right there, you'll see another cemetery. That's an Arab cemetery. The Muslims built that cemetery there. They put that cemetery there because they have control of the Temple Mount right now. And if you notice along that ridge of the wall, you see that little box right there by itself? That's the Eastern Gate. That gate is sealed. And there's an Arab cemetery in front of it. The Arabs believe that the Jews, according to their word, remember that a Jew cannot touch a dead body or else they will be unclean. So they believe by putting a cemetery there that's filled with dead bodies, that that eastern gate, which the Bible says Jesus will come through at his second coming, they closed it up and they put dead bodies in tombs there. It's just interesting that they believe the second coming of Jesus Christ more than the evangelical church does. To go as far as to cover this gate up, when you go on the inside, we've been in the inside and, and you look on the, because we've gone up in the Temple Mount, when you look at it from the inside, it's all, it's all closed up. It's even a place where they, they pray, Muslims pray. On this side, if you notice from the Temple Mount here on this side, this side of the wall, that's the southern steps. If you remember in John chapter 7, that little area there is where Jesus was, was watching the people as the, the last day of the feast was taking place. And, and, and really the ceremony was the priests were going and they were getting water from the, from, from the spring and taking it up to the temple mount where the temple was in Jesus' day. Remember, that was before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the second temple. And Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come. Remember that in John chapter 7? And it says, and this he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit. He was leading them into an invitation of, of salvation, so to speak. And this is what he was doing. He was preaching the gospel. Well, that's where Jesus did it. And right in front of it, you'll see there, right above it, another little black dome. You see that little black dome there right on top? That is also a mosque. It's called the Al-Aqsar Mosque. And that is still a mosque that is used in an operation today, just like the Dome of the Rock is. Now, remember, the Dome of the Rock dates back years, dates back years. It was there. If any of you ever watched uh, the movie of, about the Crusaders with Orlando Bloom called The Kingdom of Heaven. Anybody ever seen that movie? It's not historically accurate. You know, some people just, you know, like it just because of the story and, and the theme of it. But that's exactly the Dome of the Rock was there during that time of the Crusaders. And remember, the land of Israel has been wiped out, flattened like by Babylon. Remember, we read last week when the Assyrians took the northern kingdom captive, what did they do? They brought all these different Gentile kings into the land, and they brought their false gods. So the northern kingdom was, was a place of idolatry, and that's where the, the people of uh, Samaria were, were birthed. The Samaritan people were birthed out of that. And the southern kingdom, Judah, Jerusalem, this is it. So if we were to go back in biblical times, do you see that eastern gate there? When you look at the temple that's built, it's believed that when you were outside of the city walls and looked through the eastern gate, if it was open, you could actually look up the steps in it to where the temple was. And if the temple doors were open, you could see the curtain where the Holy of Holies was. That eastern gate. So you can see now why Christ would, is going to come through that gate. Now, don't worry. Those graves right there are not going to stop Jesus from coming through that gate. Okay? He, he's known to bust graves open. Okay? I mean, read Matthew's gospel when it says the, the, it says the graves, it says the graves of the, uh, of the people were open. So you don't worry about that. And don't worry about the block and the brick and all that that's there. 
But now the question is, where would the temple go? Some say, well, look at over here. Look at all this space over here, right? You look at that, you say, that's where it would be. No, it can't be there. Because it always was built where the eastern gate was. Now go to the second picture. It's a little bit more closer. There's the eastern gate. See it? Now, if you notice something, pay attention. I know it's kind of grainy, but, you know, it's just kind of... I was looking at all these different types of pictures and... And online, I'm like, it just goes figure online. You're not going to get a good shot. Like the devil doesn't want you to know these things. But anyways, let's. But if you notice something here, um, let's see if this little pointer thing works here. Okay, you see that there? That little cap. It's kind of like these little ones here. You see those there? This one here is called the Dome of the Spirits. Here's the Eastern Gate right here. This is more than enough room to put a temple. Now, remember in Revelation 11, where the angel spoke to John and says, do not measure the outer court, for it has been given over to the Gentiles. Revelation was written in 96 AD, about 60 years or less after Christ was raised from the dead. Okay? The court of the Gentiles, if the temple was here, and the, let's say the front door was here, and you're able to go from here right into there, right? Remember when Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem? Go back to the wider picture real quick. I'll walk you through it. So this is how we get there. There's this section right here. This section right here, this little tiny wall. You guys probably can't see that up there. You probably see it on the edge there but if here I'm, I'm blocking it but this little section this little wall here there's a road that goes down we go around right there is where the garden of gethsemane is we walk down this road from the temple mount here we walk down this road it's called the triumphal entry road jesus made his triumphal entry all the way into jerusalem into the eastern gate he'll come again like that that little tiny dome of the spirit that i showed you it's right there now go back to the closer shot i want to give you guys the court of the Gentiles, this would be it right here. If the temple was there, the court of the Gentiles would be here. Isn't that interesting? Now, why is that interesting? Because the prophecy says, or Revelation 11 says, do not measure the outer court, for it has been given over to the Gentile. Now, remember the Six-Day War. Moshe Dayan captured eastern Jerusalem. He's the Israeli general that had the patch on his eye, right? And he captures eastern Jerusalem. And... He takes this temple mount, and, and this is a very sacred place to the Muslims. Under this here is a huge rock. You're probably like, there's a lot of rocks under there. No, listen, there's tunnels under here. There's a synagogue under here. Just finished got being built. On the other side, this section back here of this wall is where the western wall is. We go underground, and we see the massive stones that are from the time that the first temple was built. What's interesting here is that the Muslims believe this rock under this dome of the rock here is where Muhammad ascended into heaven. There's no historical evidence or proof that Muhammad ever left the boundaries of Saudi Arabia. He never left the boundaries of Saudi Arabia. So there's no way that he could have made his way there to ascend to heaven from there. But the Muslims hold on to it because they know this is where the temple once was for the Jews. When you go to Israel today, if you ask a Arab uh, driver and say, take me to the Temple Mount, they'll tell you there's no Temple Mount. And they won't take you until you say, take me to the Dome of the Rock. Because that's the is a Muslim pronouncement of this place. I've had people come and they say, man, I try, to, I try to go over there again to see it. I'm like, you're better off just walking, bro. Go through the Jaffa Gate, go through the Christian Quarter, make your way around the Armenian Quarter, and there you'll see this last trip that we were there. I, I took my wife on her own personal tour and said, look, at, this, is, this is why we come, to look at this place. Look at all these people here. But you try to get a taxi, you say, hey, take me to the Temple Mount. There's like, there's no Temple Mount. They totally disregard that there was even... Why? Because they don't like the fact that one day a temple will be there. Now, this Abrahamic Accord, maybe this could be... A temple put there because some individual will make peace between the people of Israel 
and the Arabs. And part of that peace agreement will be let the Jews build their temple because you Arabs already have your mosque. There will be a third temple. And look at, here's what I think is interesting. You see where the Dome of the Spirit is? It's believed there that that would most likely be where the Holy of Holies was. Now, I find it very interesting. Why? Because if you go in the city here, within the boundaries of the city, you got this other little, you see this little box right there, right above that? That's Antonia's Fortress. You guys ever heard of that? That's where they took Jesus down. And this is where Jesus was led out. Now, keep in mind, Leviticus, the Bible says this in chapter 1, I believe it's verse 11, where it says to take the sacrifice and offer it up on the north side of the altar. Calvary, Golgotha, is out here. This is the altar. This would be considered the north side of the altar. Just like the sacrifice in Leviticus, Jesus was crucified on the north side of the altar. So I don't believe the traditional Catholic site of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The only thing amazing about that building is there's a ladder that nobody knows who put it there, and it's still there to this day. It's the only thing I go and look at. Well, the ladder's not moved. I don't go and kiss that slat that's on the floor thinking that this is where G people are rubbing their iPhones on there and doing all this weird stuff. And it's just a real creepy place, man. But outside of there is a place that we believe is Golgotha. There is a mountain that has a skull type of looking uh, carving into it. And right above that, on top of that little mountain there, is an Arab cemetery. What, why do they do that? Because they know Christians will get a hold of it and make it a site. And then right below Golgotha, if you look up Golgotha, if you Google it, Calvary, you'll see this hill that looks like a skull. At the base of it is an Arab bus stop. But right outside of it is this fenced-in area that has a tomb. And people always ask me, Pastor, do you believe this is the place where the tomb is? Well, then I tell them, well, hey, look over that wall. You see right there? That's the direction where Antonius Fortress is. Golgotha was outside of, they led Jesus from Antonius Fortress outside the city walls. He was crucified outside the city walls on the northern side of Israel, just like the sacrifice would be in Leviticus. And I says, and think about it, all accounts of Jesus being laid in the tomb say that there was a garden there. Now, there's beautiful plants and everything there where this tomb is today. And some would say, well, how do we know if it's the tomb that Jesus was in? Well, it says that there was a garden in that area. Now, here's what's interesting. There was found where that tomb is a wine press that dates back to biblical times. But not just any wine press. It's actually a wine press that is only made inside gardens. Pretty amazing, isn't it? So here you have now a wine press that archaeologists can prove was made only for a garden, the ones that would be found in gardens. So we knew this section, there was a garden here, and now there's this tomb. And then what do you have? That mountain right on the side of it that looks like a skull called Golgotha, Calvary, on the north side, outside the city walls. That's why I believe it's the place where Jesus most likely was crucified and raised from the dead. So here's the thing now. We look at this and we say, this is why this is so significant and important. Yes, indeed. One day there will be a third temple there. Now, going back to our text here, here's, here's something that the Lord is saying. You know, you look at that and you say, the temple's not there no more. No, it's not. Not because of the Babylonians, because of the Romans. Remember, it was destroyed in 70 AD. So God will restore and regather his people. Look at what he says in verse 23. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. Verse 24, here's where he will regather. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean, and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Now, verse 25, I want to talk a little bit about kind of bringing in Daniel's prophecy, this whole thing of the 70 weeks of Daniel. So 
there will be a future ruler who will make a treaty with the people of Israel. It's kind of like what we're seeing today. This is why this whole thing with, you know, that's taking place with the Abrahamic Accords is pretty interesting because they're like, you can't make this up. It's like if they have the Bible in front of them and they're reading it, but they don't. They don't have nothing. They, don't, they probably disagree with everything I'm saying. Or you can't make this stuff up. This is why I just smile. When people say, oh, where's your God now? I'm like, oh, he's here. It's, everything's going according to plan. The terms of the treaty will be for a week, which will be a period of seven years. Now, this whole thing of understanding why, if, if it says a week, where do we get seven years from? It's easy. Found in Genesis chapter 29, the story of Jacob and Laban. Remember that story? When Jacob went to work to get his wife, Rachel, he was like, man, I'm going to get her. And he's like, okay. So her dad says, hey, well, work with me and I'll give you my daughter. Well, we know the story. You can go back and read it on your own. Genesis chapter 29. So then he goes and after the time is done, he works seven years. He's like, oh man, I finally get the woman of my dreams. And he wakes up in the morning and he has her sister laying next to him. So he's upset, right? He, he feels duped. But isn't that what Jacob's life was like? He was the same way. And so then Jacob goes to Laban and Laban says, hey, you know, in our custom, you know, you wanted my younger daughter, but the older daughter, she has to be married in order for the younger daughter to be. This is why I gave her to you. And then this conversation goes this way. He says to Jacob, he says, fulfill your week. And I will give you Rachel. And the Bible says that Jacob worked another seven years. The first time a week is referred to as a week of years rather than a week of days, because seven days makes a week. Laban said, fulfill your week. And Jacob worked another seven years for Rachel. We call that law of first mention in the Bible. So we take the seven year tribulation period and we say that this treaty will be for a week, a period of seven years. And why do we use the term week? Because we believe according to the book of Daniel in chapter nine, the 70 weeks of Daniel are all prophecy that's fulfilled. The starting of it will be when a decree goes forth and a command takes place. And the Bible is very specific. You can read it. It's very specific in those couple of verses in Daniel chapter 9 in verses 21, 22, 23, 24. I love what he says. He says in those verses, he says, Daniel, this is a message. This is a word to you, your people, and your beloved city. Why is that important? Daniel was a Jew. His beloved city was Jerusalem. Remember, he was taken captive in Babylon by the Babylonians in 605 BC. Their beloved city, Jerusalem. And he says, and your people, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people. So what now is taking place in Daniel chapter 9 pertains to and only to Daniel, his people, the Jews, and their beloved city. The prophecy of the 70 weeks of Daniel does not pertain to the church. It pertains to Israel. You might say, well, I thought we are spiritual Israel. Let me just read to you what the Bible says in Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 in verse 29. This is what the Bible says here. For the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. Meaning that what God says to Israel will remain. Nobody takes Israel's place. There's not this lie that's called replacement theology. The church does not replace Israel. God's not done with Israel. So let me kind of, if I can, just kind of give you how this works in my mind. Because it's, it's hard to put it up. You know, I just, I got a graph in my mind. You guys got graphs in your mind? I got one in my mind, okay? So, so here's what I'll have you do. So in your notes, just draw a straight line across. I'm just going to give you an idea of how this works in my mind. So just draw a straight line across. And at the beginning of the line, it doesn't matter what end, just at the beginning of the line, you know, put church. You could put me. Put a little stick figure with your hands raised up. I don't care. But anyways, put me. So you're asking, here I am, Pastor David. Here is the future that's ahead of me. What does the Bible teach me about my future biblically, eschatologically, the teaching of the end times? What does it tell me about me? Here's what I think is interesting. You'll find it in the text. It says the next prophecy that we're waiting for, Israel was waiting for the coming of their Hamashiach, their Messiah, Jesus. He's already come. The next thing that we're waiting to see is what the angels told the disciples 
in Acts chapter 1, when they saw Jesus ascend, and it says, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing? In the same manner in which you've seen him received up in glory, he will come again in the clouds. So they said Jesus will come again. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Jesus said he's coming again. The angel said he's coming again. Bible prophecy says he's coming again. So what's the next prophecy that we're waiting for? Remember, there are close to, what is it, 364 prophecies about Jesus. And he fulfilled almost all of those just in his first coming. Well, what's the next prophecy we're waiting for Jesus to fulfill? The rapture of the church. It will usher in what is known as the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people debate the word rapture. Well, where's the word rapture in the Bible? It depends on what translation. If you're reading the Latin translation, it's the Latin word raptuo, where we get the English word rapture. It's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17. That there is the promise of the rapture of the church. The Bible says we will all be caught up. The Greek word for caught up is the Greek word harpazo meaning a violent snatching up. It's called the rapture of the church. So now all views hold a view of a rapture. There will be a rapture, but when will the rapture happen? Here's where all the debate begins. It is going to happen before this seven-year tribulation. Is it going to happen in the middle of the tribulation, or will it happen at the end of the tribulation? Well, it's interesting because why are we even talking about the tribulation as it pertains to the rapture, which pertains to the church? And the church is not mentioned in the Old Testament. Newsflash, just so you guys know. There's allusions that we can claim are allusions and references, but it's not referred to in the Old Testament. The closest we get to it is in the book of Daniel. But the 70 weeks, and you break that down, we don't have time tonight to go into that, but I've taught this many times here in the church. Weeks of years, 69 sevens have already been completed. The first started with... The 49 years, the seven sevens, right, of, of Nehemiah's reign as, as governor of Judah. And it says, when the going forth of the command, when the decree goes forth to rebuild the walls, not the temple, not nothing, just the walls and the streets and the gates, then the seven sevens will begin. And then from that point on, 62 sevens will follow after that. Now, for those of you good at math, you times that seven times seven is 49, but then you take... The seven and the 62, which makes 69 weeks, you times that by seven, you have 483. So he's giving us some points and he's saying here, when the going forth of the command, well, that happened March 14th, 445 BC by King Artaxerxes when he gave the decree and the command for Nehemiah to go rebuild the walls. 483 years after that, fast forward, brings you to April 6, 32 AD. What's so special about that day? It was the day that Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem to the very day. And he says that these 69 sevens will be completed when Messiah has come and he will be cut off, but not for himself. Jesus was cut off, but he didn't die for himself. He died for the sins of the world. Then the second half of that prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26 talks about this coming prince. Notice the word prince is used twice. One capitalized, the other lowercase. The first prince that's capitalized, you go back and look at that for the sake of time, we won't, because I'll get stuck there. I love this text. That is talking about Jesus. Notice just in the next verse, it says, and there will come a prince, and it's a lowercase p. It's not capitalized. That's the Antichrist. And he talks about this time in which the Antichrist, for Three and a half years will rule and reign kind of to commit the abomination of desolation. Now, keep in mind, need I remind you, he said, to your people, Daniel, to you and to your beloved city, not the church. Sixty-nine sevens have been completed with Jesus making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. What about the 70th week? The only other time in the Bible we see a period of seven years is known as the seven-year tribulation period. There is the 70th week of Daniel so where's the church? I believe according to the structure that is given in Bible prophecy, the church will be taken up before the tribulation period. 
And when do we come back? We come back to rule and reign with Christ at his second coming. The rapture of the church is not the second coming. Jesus coming back to reign, which is known as the millennial reign. Why would God regather his people? He says, I will gather you from all the countries to what? Look at verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. God's going to cleanse his people. And isn't it interesting? Guys, listen, when you look at the seven feasts of Israel in Leviticus chapter 23, Jesus is crucified during the feast of Passover. Jesus is laid in the tomb during the feast of unleavened bread. Jesus is raised from the dead during the feast of first fruits. He is the first fruits of our resurrection, Paul says. And then we're waiting for that time of Jesus' second coming. If you really think about it, the first three feasts were fulfilled in Jesus' first coming, and the last four will be fulfilled in his second coming. What's amazing about all of this here is we see one of the things concerning that would be a time, what is known as the feast or the day of atonement. It's a time in which the people will afflict their souls. Remember what God is saying. He says, the people will be cleansed. So during this feast of, of first fruits, then we have what is known as the Feast of Weeks, right? They celebrate this. What happens during the Feast of Weeks? Well, that's where the day of Pentecost took place, during the Feast of Weeks, so the coming of the Holy Spirit. After the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Trumpets. And the Bible says, with a trump, with the shout of an archangel, the church will be taken up, right? Feast of Trumpets, I believe that will... I mean, just imagine now, we're in the time of the Feast of Trumpets. Imagine if this would have been it, man, and the church would have been raptured during the Feast of Trumpets. An amazing thing. The feast or the time of the Day of Atonement here, we see is a time in which the people of Israel will afflict their souls. God will cleanse them, and God's doing a work through them. The rapture already takes place, even according to Israel's feast. And then the final feast is the Feast of Tabernacles. This is what we believe would be fulfilled in the millennial reign of Christ. Now, you look at these things and you say, so let's, let's get the lines now. So we got me, there I am, church age. The next thing that's supposed to happen is the rapture of the church. Then after the rapture of the church, listen, if you miss the rapture, you can make a lot of money. Because if you miss the rapture and you know you missed it, you can say Jesus is coming in seven years and you will be correct. Today, no man knows the day nor the hour. But if you miss the rapture, you will know the day and you will know the hour. You can say in seven years he's coming. And trust me, many people have tried to set dates. But literally after the rapture of the church in seven years, Jesus will come. The tribulation period begins. So you can write in your little line, the church, the rapture, the tribulation. After the tribulation, the second coming of Christ. And you can put a little space in between your little line there and just write the millennial reign of Christ, where Christ will come back and rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. If he came the first time, he's coming a second time. He rules and reigns. And then we also see in the text, especially in the book of Revelation, after you can look at Revelation chapter 20, we see in chapter 19, Christ on a white horse coming in verse 11. He's seen heaven open, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written on them and no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. I love that. John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and we beheld his glory as only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Here is the word. This is Jesus. This is the second coming of Jesus. This is after spiritual Babylon is destroyed, so to speak. The tribulation is ended and here now we have what's ushering in the millennial kingdom. In chapter 20 of Revelation, it says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. This is the millennial kingdom. Now, we are premillennial. In other words, we believe that this is a literal thousand years. And that Jesus ushers in the second coming before the millennial kingdom happens. 
There are those that take a view and they say, well, you know, we are post-millennial, meaning that we believe that Jesus' reign in the millennium is not literal years, but it's a spiritual reign, and that the church ushers in the millennial kingdom. <laughs> Trust me, the church can barely stand on its own two feet now. Then we have what's called all millennialism, and the all is not an A-L-L, -L, it is the letter A, and it's a prefix, and it means no millennium. They don't believe in the literal thousand reign of Christ, and they also do what is known as dual hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is, the word actually is a Greek word, hermeneutikos, which actually means to interpret. It's, it's the measure by which we interpret scripture, and they do what is known as a dual hermeneutics, meaning that all the prophecy that has already been fulfilled up until the time of the apostles was literal and was prophecy fulfilled like Jesus. And then anything after that future prophecy is not like that. It's more spiritual and symbol than anything. I think that then that leads us to take the entirety of the book of Revelation and look at it more as symbolism and spiritual rather than meaning what the text says. I don't think the Bible supports any of these views of millennialism other than the premillennial view that Jesus will come back, rule and reign for a thousand years, and he ushers in the millennial kingdom. What's going to happen in that millennial kingdom? Well, as Ezekiel goes and shares a little bit more, he says here in the book of Ezekiel, he says there's going to be a temple, there's going to be offerings and sacrifices. People say, why would there need to be a temple and offering and sacrifices in the millennial kingdom, we're already saved, we're already born again, you know, we're reigning with Christ. Why? Remember that the Bible says in Revelation, Jesus will come at a second time, he will rule with an iron fist. Because the tribulation is going to be a time where God pours out his wrath. And everybody will be thrown in the lake of fire, like the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan. They'll be cast into the lake of fire. They'll be the first to go in. Then at the great white throne judgment where the sea will give up the dead and ultimately there is a great separation of the sheep and the goat, then all of humanity that rejected God will go into the lake of fire. Nobody's in the lake of fire right now. Nobody is. It's, 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 there's nobody there yet. It will happen on that day. But, but what's going to happen? Well, there will be a resistance. Not everybody's going to follow the law of God. It says he has to rule with an iron fist and we are here to enforce the word of God. Today, there's so much push of pushing the word of God out. But in that day, it will be the law, but there will be resistance. Somebody asked me this question. I, I, I don't know if they're here tonight, but they asked me this question. They says, they were watching a movie about the rapture of the church. And I'll tell you guys, don't watch those before you go to bed. You're going to have dreams that you missed it. Anyways, um, it's usually what the dreams consist of. I had a dream about the rapture. And then it's kind of like, well, did you, were you taken up? No, I was left behind. It was so scary. So, you know, listen. <laughs> But, but here's the point I want you to get. They asked me the question. They says, well, what about women that are pregnant? What if they're, you know, you know they're here and, and babies are innocent and they're without sin? Um, just so you know, they will remain with their parent that's unbelieving. Ultimately, they will be born during the time of the tribulation. They say it's going to be a very difficult time. And it even warns the women. It says those who are nursing and those who are pregnant, it's like head for the heels, man. Well, what about those babies? Well, if they die, then ultimately they will go to heaven. But what about women that are pregnant and are believers? Well, the baby's going to be raptured up with the mom. But the ones that are unbelievers are going to stay here. They're going to be born into a time of tribulation, and the earth will repopulate itself in the millennial kingdom. And there will be two types of citizens dwelling on the earth, those that have a glorified body like Jesus did when he was with his disciples after his resurrection, the church will have a glorified body. And we will rule and reign with Christ. Some people are worried. They're like, oh, in the millennium, what if I mess up again? You can't mess up. You're glorified now. So anyways, that's your timeline there, the great white throne judgment. And so if, you, know, you look at that, this is how it all works in our minds. So this fits within what the Lord is saying. I want to close tonight with this. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments to do them. God is the one who reconciles his people. 
This is during the millennial kingdom, guys. Listen, this is after the rapture of the church, after the great tribulation, the seven-year tribulation period, the 70th week of Daniel, we believe will be fulfilled then. Then you shall dwell in the land, and that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Remember that whole land, the lines that we see in that first picture? That's all of it right here in verse 28 of chapter 36. They're going to get it all. I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. Notice the emphasis, all of your uncleanness. I will call for a grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. I will multiply the fruit of your trees and increase your fields so that your need never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. God commands his people to remember. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. This is why there's a need for a temple in the millennial kingdom. It's a memorial. He says here, you're going to remember there's going to be a memorial for your sake. Do I do this, says the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. So that the world will know, guys, that the Lord, he is God. Thus says the Lord, on the day that I cleanse you, notice the emphasis again, from all your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities and the ruins will be rebuilt. The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. So they will say, this land was desolate, has become like the Garden of Eden. And the wasted, desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. God renews his people. He even renews the place where they will be. Then the nations which are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it and I will do it. Guys, Israel will never perish. God will keep his promise. God wants his people to look to him. He says this, thus the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. I will increase their men like a flock, like a flock offered as a holy sacrifice, like a flock at Jerusalem on its feast day. So shall the ruined cities be filled with floods and flocks of men. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. That's a lot of information, isn't it? But it's exciting information, isn't it? Yeah, praise God for that. When you, when you go, I, I wish I could take the whole church to Israel and just walk with you guys everywhere. And just Because when you go and you come and you see, then you begin to realize, man, everything's going according to plan. Don't lose heart, church. Our redemption draweth nigh. We're almost out of here. Hold on. 